By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have two strong competitors playing against each other, two tough decks. I believe there are two Americans. We've got Rich Burke who is playing with a very competitive, let me have a quick glance here at his list, with a very competitive blue, uh, red, white deck. I mean, this is the serious stuff. I believe it's also the deck he played at Lobster Con. He's also playing, of course, the two black cards. I don't even have to mention them and the one green card that is in all of these decks. So we're actually gonna look at his list in a moment. So we're gonna zoom into that and we're gonna talk about it. And he's playing against Chet uh, Lawler and Chet is also playing with pretty cool deck. Uh, it's a little bit different than uh, than the one from, uh, from Rich. It's more focused on, it also has blue, but it's got green as the other main color and, and white actually, white is in there as well. And of course we have those two black usual suspect cards in there as well. So I believe both of these decks, they're pretty competitive. And um, uh, they're first going to play two games without sideboard and then two games with sideboard. So this is going to be very interesting. But first we will jump into the actual deck decks of both of these decks. Um, now if you wanna skip that, no problem. There's a description below. Click on the timestamp that will take you straight to game one. And here we are going to continue with the deck tech, starting with the deck of Rich Burke. And here we see the deck that Rich Burke is playing today. Now, before I continue with the deck tech, I just want to give a quick shout out because Rich Burke has a fantastic Twitch channel, uh, which if you like old school magic, it's really worth a visit. I believe he plays live weekly, but please Rich, correct me in the comments below if I'm wrong. Uh, and in the description below, you can find a link to his Twitch channel. So definitely worth a visit uh, if you're a fan of old school, and I'm sure you are when you're watching this video. Okay, now, Looking at the deck, this is the deck he played for LobsterCon. And as you can see, I think it's, this is very competitive. Uh, we see the usual suspects, the Force of Random Pafrits, the Force of Anna Lines, that is creature base in a lot of these aggro tier one decks. And we see four Mistress Factories as well. So basically what he wants to do is get his creatures out quickly, do a little bit of damage with his creatures, not that much, because look at the second row. There is a lot of direct damage. Four Chain Lightnings, four Lightning bolts two psionic blasts so in other words if he can just put i don't know eight points of damage with his creatures he can probably finish it off with direct damage that's all he has to do and then of course to refill his hand he's got the wheel of fortune he's got the time twister if he needs another combat phase uh, or just another draw step he's got the uh the time walk so of course he's had the, he has that power in there we see the two uh, black cards demonic tutor and mind twist I mean, Demonic Tutor is just great because basically it's another direct damage card to finish your opponent off. And I, I completely forgot to mention the Fireball that's on row number four here. So, I mean, this is a very strong list. And I also like the inclusion here of the Atog because the thing is, if you have a very aggressive deck and this is an aggressive deck and you deal a lot of damage, that means your opponent is under pressure. And when you're under pressure, the Atog is such an annoying creature to play against because your opponent is gonna attack and you're forced to kind of block the Atog because you know, if I'm not blocking it, he's probably gonna feed his Moxen, you know, all his jewelry to the Atog and I'm gonna drop so low that I'm vulnerable to a Psionic Blast or to a Chain or a Lightning Bolt. I don't want that to happen. So you're kind of forced to make unfavorable blocks. And in that regard, I also like the inclusion here of the Surrender Jin because that's kind of the top of his mana curve. That's four mana, and that's the highest costing um, card in his entire deck. So it's really the the card that he wants to play as a finisher as well. Remember, this is a five six, and yes, he has to sacrifice some lands uh, to keep it around, but. Who really cares if your opponent is that low and you have a 5-6 flyer, that is really, really a big problem. So I think that's also a good inclusion and I hope that the Surrendip, uh, Surrendip Jin can see some action because it's, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite cards, I think, when I look at this deck. Actually, it is the, the favorite card for me personally in, in this deck. Uh, it is a very strong deck and I'm not surprised that Rich decided to take these cards or to, to choose this deck to play LobsterCon. And he's playing against Chet Lawler, so let's take a look at the deck of Chet. And here we see the deck of Chet. So this is what Chet's bringing to the table today to take Rich on. And interesting here, we kind of see that same blue component with the four Surrender Pafrits and also the Surrender Gin in this deck. Really nice, interesting to see a Surrender Gin in a deck where you also have 
uh, Armageddon's and you don't have a land tax, for example. So that's quite, quite an interesting take. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that's going to work. Um, I think that the strategy of this deck is he wants to uh, use his disenchants and crumbles to take care of the mana rocks of his opponents, of the Mox and you know, Soul Ring, uh, possibly Felber Stones if they're there, just to make sure he doesn't have that artifact mana and then use his uh, Winter Orb to make it really difficult for his opponent to use his lands. And then later in the game or before that, use his Armageddon, get rid of all the lands of the opponent and of course also his own lands, but that doesn't really matter if he already has more creatures or stronger creatures on the board. I think it's basically that simple. In that sense, it's kind of an Urnum Geddon deck, but then um, you could say made more interesting. Like it's got more elements to it. Of course, it's got that whole blue in there with the Surrendips. It also has the Suchis. I think the Suchis are in there for when you're facing an Abyss. Um, I do think this, this deck seems a little vulnerable to uh, a city in a bottle because if you have a city in a bottle against you that's nine cards down luckily for chad he's not facing a city in a bottle today and um the th i think it's going to be a difficult matchup actually for for chad because what he wants to do is he wants to play out bigger and better creatures before his opponent can and then basically use his disenchants crumbles and armageddon's and winter orbs to kind of deny mana from his opponent now of course the problem with uh, his opponent today is that Rich doesn't need a lot of mana to do his thing. You know, that being said, I mean, this is a strong deck, so I think it's going to be uh, an interesting fight. Now, the first two games are going to be without sideboard, and after that, they're going to play with sideboard. So after the first two games, I'm kind of, will discuss a little bit about sideboard tech. So this is the deck of chat. Now let's go to the games. Game number one, pre-sideboard. Oh, look at that start from Rich. Is that a Library of Alexandria? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Let's hope the chat can find a solution for this. And, of course, he's going to draw his extra card, playing a Volcanic, and there we see a Zavanna here from, uh, from chat. Let's take a look. There is a Mishra's Factory. But, uh, ooh, is this going to be a Loa game? The famous Loa games that you, you see from time to time in old school. And there is a Surrender Perfreet. 3-4 Flyer. And there is a Crumble. Look at that interesting Crumble here on the Mox Pearl. Does that mean that he has maybe a Winter Orb? Plays a Mox Ruby. And there is a Suchi, interesting. And maybe next turn, remember he plays with Armageddon, so I mean, next turn he could possibly play an Armageddon. Damage, of course, here for Rich from his own Surrendip. Keeps drawing those cards from his Loa. And that, of course, is the biggest problem right now for, for Chad. But if he can play an Armageddon, that is all taken care of. Attacking here with three points, dropping Chad back to 17. And that's all he does. Maybe he's keeping a counter spell up to protect himself from any land destruction. There is a tropical island though, so I guess he doesn't have an Armageddon or doesn't want to play it yet. Let's see what he can do here. Probably going to swing in. Why not? It's exactly what he does. And, you know, if if Rich would decide, and he's not doing it, would decide to activate his factory, I mean, why would he? Then, ooh, there's a time walk. This is interesting. <laughs> there is the counter spell. What I wanted to say is if he would activate his factory, then Chet kind of knows, okay, he doesn't have a counter spell in hand. And here we see that counter spell. And I think if Chet has an Armageddon in hand, he's he doesn't really mind this. He's like, you know what? You've, you've used your counter spell, and now I can... Uh, play my Armageddon safely, then again, I mean, Rich is drawing so many cards, maybe he's found another counter spell. Taking more damage, he's now down to 12, playing a Demonic Tutor. Interesting here, and he's probably gonna maybe find a Time Walk to take another turn. Because, you know, Ancestral Recall is an option, but do you really need more cards with already an active Loa? I think you want to have another turn, untap everything, be able to counter. That's exactly what he does. So he's going to take another turn, untaps everything, does take another damage from his 
Surrender for free. Gonna drop to 11. Another card from the lower. That's low as doing so much work. Attacking here for three. Chandler's gonna drop. Or sorry, Chandler. <laughs> it's not. We're not in France, people. Chat. Chat is gonna drop here to, I think, uh, to eight here. And things are not looking great for Chad. It's really difficult to play against the low because your opponent just has so many resources in hand all the time. I mean, the best thing he can do here is maybe play an Armageddon, hope for the best. He's actually going to animate attack here for six. He can pump it, bring it, bring it up to, oh, there's a lightning bolt. At least dealing some damage here. That means that Rich is going to drop to seven. Yeah, he's going to drop to seven here. Next turn, he'll drop to six. And this is the thing. Chet doesn't have direct damage, but Rich does. And that direct damage, that might just be the difference here in this first game. Well, of course, the low is the difference, but that's what's going to kind of give Rich possibly the victory here. Uh, we see Chet dropping here to five life. There is, to make matters worse, there is a Chaos Orb here that he can use, of course, to flip on the Suchi if he wants to. Doesn't have to do that right now. He can just wait. He could also choose to block with the factory. So he's choosing to attack here. And Rich has some options. Choosing here to flip. So he's going to flip. Do we see a disenchant? There is a disenchant, and that's of course the power of white here. There's the disenchant on the chaos orb, but there's a counter spell. Ooh, oh, this is unfortunate. And that means we're going to see a flip. And as you can see, we're already in slow mo. So let's see. I think if Rich hits this one, I mean things were already looking good for him, but if he hits the Suchi here, he's pretty much got this first game. So let's take a look there. We see the flip. Bam, and it's it's a good flip. It's a nice flip. So that's a hit here for Rich. That means the Suchi goes bye-bye. And, uh, well, what else do we have here? What else can Chet do? He's now going into his second main, I guess. And uh, is he passing turn here? Actually, gonna play something here. Tapping three. What will he do with the mana? Or is he just tapping one here? It's a little unclear to me right now. Okay, he's untapping everything again. And it looks like they're kind of discussing options, what he can and what he can do. I, I do think here that, oh yeah, he's playing his own Surrendip. A freed. So he now also has that 3-4 powerhouse. So that means at least he's got a blocker for the flyer. But I think I think that Rich will probably draw into some direct damage here to finish the game off. But you never know. Oh, he's actually just gonna attack with everything he has, putting him really low, and then finish yeah, finishing it off with a lightning bolt here. I mean that was uh <laughs> that was that was as to be expected. That's what you know when, when you get low enough and you're playing against a player with, with chains and with lightning bolts, it's going to be really, really difficult. And Rich even has psionic blasts as well. Okay, let's uh let's go to game number two. Game number two. So this is still without sideboard. First two games without second uh third and fourth game with. Oh look at this opening by Chad here. Wow. Okay, this is a Tundra, Mox Sapphire, and a Black Lotus. And they're, of course, Ancestral Recall. Why not? I was actually expecting a Time Twister from you, chat. So this is a little disappointing. And not a big creature. This is interesting. So we don't see... This is something I expect. I expect him to play a Surrender for free. Look at this opening by Rich. Double Savannah Lions here. Wow. This is some fireworks straight from the start. I mean, oh man, if you're Chet, what are you going to do now? Maybe, I mean, he needs a creature, Suchi, whatever. Okay, a little glitch here, but he's back. Let's see what he's going to do. 
Tapping his Tendra, Sapphire, of course, disenchanting. You can really see that's part of his strategy, really trying to take care of that mana sources of his opponent. And there, of course, we didn't see the Urnum, but there's the Urnum Jin here. And uh, still pretty good. Attacking with both here, of course, of course, of course. Blocking one of the lines and then taking a bolt. I mean, it's not too bad for Chad. It's a two for one. It's not too bad, but of course he had to use his Lotus. Okay, let's let, let's see, let's see. There's a um, factory, there's a Suchi. Remember, there are actually more creatures in Chad's deck than in the deck of Rich. So that could be an advantage. Is he gonna block again, knowing that, actually he's not, he's just gonna take the damage, he's not willing to do that same trade again. Here we see him tapping three, taking a damage. There's a Surrendip Afrit, three, four flyer. And maybe, I mean, if Chet can find a surrender of his own, he's, he's pretty much in the clear. Playing a Mox Pearl here. And attacking it with the 4-4. Dealing 4 damage here to Rich. And uh, I believe it's now Rich who's on 13 and Chet who's on 16 at the moment. Attacking with both, so he can deal five damage here. That means he's gonna to drop to 11. Interesting, choosing not to block with his Mishra's Factory. And taking a damage from the city. Fireball three. Very aggressive strategy here. And this is basically what I talked about in the deck tech as well. Rich only has to do so much damage with his creatures and finish it off with direct damage. And is that gonna happen now again here in this second game? And does that mean a 2-0 for Rich here? Attacking here with the Suchi. So we see Rich dropping to eight. Of course, keeping his factory at bay probably to take care of the Lions. Dropping to seven, but I mean, remember if Rich gonna attack, which he will, Chet will drop here to five, at least because of the surrender. Now he's probably gonna activate his factory. And will there be a bolt in response? He's going to activate it, block and tap, making it a 3-3, killing the lines. Now the fact that, that Rich is not doing anything probably means that he's going to finish him off right now with direct damage. Oh, there's a balance. That is interesting because that means he's going to lose his factory. And of course, he's going to lose a lot of cards because look at that card total of, uh, of Rich. It's pretty low. Discarding two land cards is not too bad. And an interesting strategy here from Rich playing that balance. And there he is going to block on his Mishra's factory. And there we see the Argovian Pixies. He's dropping to six. This is actually quite exciting. I figured out Rich would finish it off with direct damage, but that's actually not happening. There is a Savannah Lines. Chet's on two life, Rich on six. If he can take care of the line somehow, he can get six damage in. He just needs to get rid of the line. The question is, can he do that? And he is thinking in the tank, what can he do? Attacking with bow first, probably gonna jump against the Suchi. Gonna drop to four here. Oh, if only he had a psionic blast. Oh, and there's the bolt. There is the bolt. Ay, 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 ay. I mean, if Chet would have had a psionic blast, he could have won. Oh, man. Or something, you know, to take care of that lion. But hey, it is what it is. That means that uh, Rich has won both of these games pre sideboard. And now these players are going to go into their sideboards. And we're going to watch two games with their sideboards. Before we jump to the sideboard games, I thought it might be interesting to have a quick glance at the sideboards of both of these players. Now, this is the sideboard of Chet. Um, as you can see, um, he's got some interesting cards in here. Maybe Red Elemental Blast could be a good one to board in. Remember uh, the big role that those counter spells played, especially in game number one. So with that red elemental blast, he has an answer to those. And of course they can take care of those nasty flyers to surrender the freaks. 
Uh, also, um, swords to plows here, I think could be a good inclusion as uh, well. And then avoid fates, I don't think I would do that. Concordant crossroads, I think it, it just benefits rich too much. So I wouldn't do that as well. And then we've got the, uh, the dust to dust. I think it's got enough artifact removal. So for me personally, I would probably board in two or three red elemental blasts. And I would just board in all four swords because you, you just want to take care of that, of that pressure of the creatures. Of course, the downside of swords is maybe board in three, not four, but the downside of, of the sword to plow here is, uh, is that you're giving life to your opponent. And of course you don't want to do that because by giving rich life, you're giving time to draw into more threats, more direct damage and finish you off. So it's, it's kind of difficult to play with swords, but still, I mean, Swords can give you time. It's better than dying on the spot. You know what I mean? So I would I would board in swords against this deck of rich. That's what I would do. I don't know what Chad has done. I guess that's what we're going to find out in game number three. So this is the sideboard of Chad. Now let's take a look at the sideboard of rich. And here we see the sideboard of rich. This is interesting. And the reason I'm saying it's interesting is because I'm seeing two control magics and I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe you should play those control magics because your opponent is playing with more creatures. Yes, he has disenchants, but he wants to use his disenchants on your mana rocks. And then again, maybe even if he does disenchant a control magic, it's not that bad. So it's interesting. You could consider adding a control magic. Uh, we do see an earthquake in his sideboard, which I find kind of difficult because Yes, an Earthquake is good against, for example, the Pixies, but he's also playing with Savannah Lines himself. So I'm not sure if, if it's it's that good of an inclusion. Um, he's playing with four Disenchant. That could work really well against the Suchi. So maybe board in one or two Disenchants. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of tricky. I really like those Armageddons, by the way, Rich. The nice signature. Really cool, very crisp looking as well. Um, I don't think I would board in any Armageddon since that's basically what your opponent wants to do. Um, but yeah, interesting here. He's, he's got a lot of interesting choices to make. I wouldn't do Energy Flux. I don't think I would do Earthquake personally. I think I would board in two Control Magics and maybe, I mean, you could add the Spirit Links. Basically your opponent wants to win with um, by dealing combat damage. So Spirit Links and Control Magics kind of protect you from that. So yeah, why not just add all four? That's what I would do. I don't think I would board in a Disenchant. Then again, he's playing with Suchi, so maybe two Disenchants as well. The problem is everything you put in, you've got to take something out and taking cards out part, that's kind of for me where it gets tricky. So it's easy for me to say, why not put all six in, but what are you going to put out? And remember, I think the reason that Rich Deck performed so well in game one and two is because it's so focused on dealing damage to your opponent instead of dealing with the threats of your opponent if you can follow uh, my train of thought here so because his deck is so efficient in dealing damage that is probably why he was so successful in game one and two so when you're putting more defense cards in you know answer cards i guess you could call them as well like a spirit link like a control magic like a disenchant that takes you away from your a plan so for me personally, maybe I would board in maybe one or two control magics, one or two spirit links, and maybe one or two disenchants, but it, I wouldn't put all six in. So I would maybe go for four sideboard cards max. That's what I would do in this scenario. Of course, I don't know what Rich did. So why don't we go to game numbers three and four and, uh, and find out, let's go to the games. Game number three here about to begin. So with sideboards, game number three and four with sideboards. So let's see if that makes a big change here in this matchup. I'm kind of rooting for Chet here. You know, I really uh, would like to see him get his first victory here against Rich. And look at that opening here from Rich, pretty strong. Black Lotus and that early pressure with the Mishra's factory. That means he can start swinging in next turn. There we see a City of Brass from Chet. Actually, also pretty good because now if he decided to board in a red elemental blast, at least he can play it. There is a Savannah. And let's see what Chet can do here. Probably hoping to play something. Maybe a Pixies. No, there is. That was a time walk, I believe. So he's taking an extra turn. Drawing a card. Can he find a land drop here? And uh, looks like he's a little bit in the tank. 
and oh interesting i don't know if you saw that i believe that was a regrowth a regrowth on his time walk things are not looking great for chad again i mean he's gonna take probably four damage here yeah swing in for four going to 12 now he's got the time walk he can play out but that's not really an answer it's it's better than nothing okay loa that's something i believe he's got seven in hand so he can draw an extra card then draw the the time or then play the time walk what is he going to do here? Draw the extra card. Play a Mock Sapphire. That means he's got... Seven in hand right now. What is he going to do? And yeah, there we see the Time Walk again. Okay, so he did regrowth the Time Walk. So he's going to take an extra turn. Going to use the Loa again, of course. So, I mean, hopefully he can find something against those factories because he's already on 12. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of seeing this scenario again where Rich will simply finish the game with direct damage. I mean, it's that that's always the strength of, of red. Okay, tapping. You're playing a Soul Ring. And I, I, now, I now kind of wonder if, if, if Chad boarded in any, um, any sorts to Plowsiers. Playing two. Okay, this is an interesting weapon. Ooh, Mana Drain. Ay, 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 ay. Is he going to counter the Mana Oh, he's going to Mana Drain the Mana Drain. <laughs> you got to love that stuff. Hey, mana Drain, your Mana Drain. That means he gets two extra mana now in his second main. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, man, that's just funny. Mana Drain the Mana Drain. Why not? And that means that he can still swing in for two if he chooses to untap his factory. Decides not to, though. Untapping his Tundra instead, playing a City of Brass. And there is a Chain Lightning dropping Chad here to six. But it looks like he kind of has control. Untapping his Savannah, of course, because he's now low on cards. So untapping the Loa doesn't make any sense right now. He doesn't want to take damage. I think Savannah is the right choice to make. He's got a lot of mana, actually. I think the problem also for Chad is that he's also playing with the Serendips. What do we see here? An Urnum. Okay, an Urnum is... That's good. That's good. Ooh, Counterspell. That is unfortunate. That is unfortunate. Interestingly, he's deciding to untap his city. So I guess he needs... He needs Rat Mana, of course, to deal more damage. So that means he's going to drop to three here. That means he's in Bolt range. Things are looking bad for Chad. I think I think you've done really well, Chad, getting yourself back into this game. But the problem is that Rich is then already too far ahead for you to get back because of that direct damage component in his deck. Let's take a look what he can do. He's not dead yet. Playing another Savannah. He's got a lot of lands. Will we see another Urnum? No counterspell this time. And of course, uh, Rich also doesn't have the land to play out another counterspell. Untapping his City of Brass, drawing passing turn. He's just waiting probably for direct damage. But in the meanwhile, things are looking good here for, for Chad. At least he can swing in for four. Which is something. I think he kind of has to. He has to put pressure on, right? Disenchant on the Sapphire. Good decision here. And that always that always makes a Winter Orb stronger. If you're playing with Winter Orb, just having uh, having artifact removal in play. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is what can happen. And yeah, you kind of see this coming when you're just when you're low enough against a deck uh, with so much direct damage. You know you're you're playing on borrowed time, and that's exactly what happened here. So that's another win here for Rich. Uh, and hopefully we're going to go into our last game and uh, I'm really rooting for you, Chad. Hopefully you can uh, you can uh, regain some honor by winning game number four. So let's go to game number four. Game number four here. I want to say number three. I'm so used to saying number three. Uh, <laughs> that's number four. The, the last game that these two players are going to play. And this is uh, with sideboards. Ooh, good start here from Chad Mox, Jet Mox, Ruby. Unfortunately, not a creature or anything else on the board, though. Uh, and also a Mishra's Factory. And there we see a Mox Pearl and a City of Brass opening here from 
Rich, there's a tropical island here from chat. Let's see what he can do here. Tapping two, no. What is he going to do? Attacking here for two. Of course, the risk of, yeah, of the bolt. And do we see, oh, I like it. Avoid fate, avoid fate. Interesting, like I said in the in the uh, sideboard tech, I wouldn't board in and avoid fate, but hey, man, I'm loving this. <laughs> the nice thing is, you know you can be more aggressive with your factories if you have that avoid fate backup. Look at this energy flux from the side. This is pretty brutal. He can choose to to tap both of his moxes to, to keep one safe, or he can just decide, you know what, whatever. Uh, oh, he's actually tapping everything to keep his moxen around. Interesting. So he, maybe he has a disenchant in hand. And look at that rich choosing a different route saying, you know what, I'm just going to sack my mox using it to activate my my factory attacking here. So I'm I'm assuming Chad has a disenchant here in hand. That's what I think he, that's what I'm thinking of. But we'll see. Maybe they're discussing it now, like how the triggers work. Tapping everything. Drawing. I think that even if you have a disenchant and you play during upkeep, you still have to pay for the cost of the artifacts. Let me know in the comments below if I'm wrong. And this is pretty brutal for Chad. He doesn't find another land drop. And there we see a crumble. So we see some more like defense cards from Chet, some more removal cards here from Chet, kind of making sure he doesn't take uh, a lot of damage here from the creatures. He is dropping to 15 because of that chain, of course. Again, tapping for the energy flux. That energy flux is doing great work for Rich here. And we also see now a Mox Jet being played. There is, there we, yeah, there is that disenchant. That is, of course, what Chet was waiting for. And he was a bit, a bit unlucky like he's been pretty unlucky this whole match so far um in that third turn was it oh at turn number four i mean where he couldn't find his land drop to to play the disenchant so he's he's now taking care and i think it would have probably been better for him to wait with playing the disenchant because now rich doesn't have to tap anything for his mox jet but anyway, potato, potato, uh, we see a Savannah lines are being cast by Rich past the turn here. And now Chad has a lot of land and mocks and a lot of mana to his disposal. What is he going to do here? I'm hoping he's going to do something marvelous. Tapping Savannah, tapping Ruby. And there is another disenchant, this time on the mox Chat. And Rich only having two cards in hand. And he's actually swinging in for two. Oh, he's playing a Demonic Tutor. I already thought, why would you make that trade? But he's playing a Demonic Tutor. Probably going to look up an Ancestral Recall here to refill his hand. Ooh, or not. Interesting. Because he decides not to tap his factory, but tapping his drop instead. So I thought he's going to keep his drop... Tropical Island untapped because he wants to be able to play out um, Ancestral Recall. Ooh, look at that. So he's activating it with his Sapphire. I forgot about the Sapphire. And there we see a Divine Offering here. Ay, 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 taking care of that Mistress Factory. So we see that two damage being dealt here by the Savannah Alliance. That means that Chad is now on 13 and Rich is on 14. I am liking this game number four. It's uh, it's more exciting than the previous game. Oh, this is what he wants to do, Armageddon. And this is the first time we see an Armageddon being played by Chad, and that's basically what his deck wants to do. He is going to drop to 11 because Rich still has that one lonely lion playing a Ruby out. That means he's got direct damage capability again, which is not great for Chad here, but he's still on 11. It's not too bad. He does need a blocker now for that lion. Cannot find it, dropping to nine. Ooh, look at that, another Mock Sapphire, wow. So much beautiful jewelry here on the board. Okay, okay, this is something factory, that is a good news. <laughs> of course, why not, Black Lotus, why not, passing turn. And oh, Ancestral Recall, this is what kind of, this is what can get Rich back into this game, and he wasn't really behind in the game, attacking here. And is he, he's going to trade. 
I don't think he can because he just, uh, yeah, exactly. He, it cannot pump itself because he just uh, played the Mishra's factory. So that means he's trading right now, which is not the best thing to do. He's also taking three damage, dropping to six. Ay, 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 ay. It's not looking good. For a moment there, after that Armageddon, I thought, ooh, he's he might win this one. Attacking here, dropping to four. Will we see? No, he doesn't have enough mana, mana for Cyblast. Dropping to one. And again, we have this borrow time scenario where you're playing against a direct damage deck and you're on a really low life total. And yeah, this is not really making a dent in the board. And there is a fireball. Boom. That's it. That's another win. Okay, well, uh, I guess the conclusion is that uh, Rich, your deck is pretty good, so congratulations. Maybe you can let us know in the comments below um, how you did in uh, in LobsterCon, because I believe this was the deck you played in LobsterCon. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for sharing this game with us right here on Timmy Talks. And like I said in the introduction, this is a collaboration between Timmy Talks, myself, and, uh, and Rich Burke. Uh, because he's got a pretty sweet Twitch account, so if you're interested in old school magic, you can check the description below. Uh, click on the Twitch, you know, and, and check out his games. I believe he plays live every Tuesday. Um, but, you know, Rich, if I'm wrong, please correct me because I don't know all your your dates of when you're, when you're uh, showing live magic. Anyway, thank you very much for sharing this game. Congratulations with your 4-0 victory. Um, I did like the deck of chat. I have to say that I did like the deck of chat. I just think that it was for him a bad matchup. Uh, and yeah, direct damage, it's, it's such a pain to play against. As soon as you're under, I don't know, nine, you're vulnerable, you know. I guess an opponent with four chains, four bolts, psionic blast. I mean, it's a madhouse. It is a madhouse. I did really like that avoid fate, by the way, in, uh, in game number four. Okay, so this is it for today. Thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. Now, if you want to support the channel, um, you can do so by becoming a patron. There's probably a link popping up right now uh, to Timmy's Patreon page. So please click on the link, have a look. Maybe it's something for you. You can already support the channel starting with $1 a month. So it's really, it's a really small amount. Um, and other things you can do to support, free things you can do to support the channel is actually watch this episode that you just did. Uh, don't use ad blocker. I appreciate it if you don't. I understand if you do, but I appreciate it if you don't. And also, uh, leave a comment. YouTube loves that stuff. Leave a comment, leave a like. Share this on your socials. I mean, it's good, man. Then you're showing YouTube, I think this is quality content. So thank you if you're doing that. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the fantastic, amazing, beautiful patrons of Timmy Talks. Ich kann das Ficket zu Samba gesehen.